Aujourd'hui, je vous présente Olivier Rossler, qui fait partie du Brain Embodiment Lab de l'Université de Reading au Royaume-Uni. Et puis, il est aussi membre de, du AI Lab, Laboratoire d'Intelligence Artificielle, je ne sais pas comment le dire en, en, en hollandais, du Freie Université de Bruxelles, et ainsi que modalité.ai, qu'il expliquera lui-même. Ses recherches portent sur le développement de mécanismes permettant euh, les interactions, euh, interactions hommes-agents naturelles, adaptatives et ouvertes. Et son approche interdisciplinaire combine la représentation des connaissances, le, des connaissances du raisonnement, l'ancrage du langage, dont il va parler beaucoup aujourd'hui, l'apprentissage par l'action basée sur l'apprentissage par renforcement, renforcement et aussi la prédiction multimodale des états affectifs et mentaux chez les humains. Ça, il ne va probablement pas en parler, mais c'est peut-être lié à modality.ai. Modality Oliver Ressler est dans le Brain Embodiment Lab, University of Reading, et le AI Lab, Freya Université de Bruxelles, as well as modality.ai, which he will explain perhaps in a few words. His research is on the development of mechanisms to enable natural, adaptive, and open-ended human agent interactions. His interdisciplinary approach combines work in knowledge representation, reasoning, language grounding, and action learning based on reinforcement learning, which we'll also, he'll touch on also today, and also on multimodal prediction of human affective and mental states which is perhaps related to modality, the Modality website, and he may say a few words about that. And with that, it gives me pleasure to present Olivier Ressler. Hello, uh, thank you very much for the nice introduction. Uh, one thing I forgot to say, how okay. would you like to handle discussion? You have the choice of either waiting till the, telling everyone to wait till the end, or accepting oral questions to interrupt you, or a compromise, asking people to put questions in the chat And I can tell you if I, I can uh, ask you if you're willing to have a question uh, from. I think I think uh, the easiest is if people just ask the questions, and then I can, uh, if if it makes sense to answer immediately, for uh, to foster understanding, then I will answer immediately, or maybe I will say, okay, I will anyway touch upon this question on the next slide, and then we'll answer a little bit later. But I think it's easier because I'm not sure whether I will see the chat when I'm uh, sharing the screen, so. I think it's easier people just ask. Okay, go ahead, please. Okay, so, uh, yeah, thank you for the nice introduction. I think I will directly share my screen. Uh, so, yeah, can you see my screen? Yes, yes, we see it. Uh, okay, perfect. Um, so, yeah, so, The talk will be about com combining unsupervised and supervised grounding approaches. But uh, since uh, I can say a few words about uh, modality AI also before. So this is kind of more related to my work at the AI lab. Um, so which is basically my, uh, my, my PhD work also. Um, and so at modality AI, this is more like the last part of my research interest about uh, multimodal interactions and uh, like diagnosis and Uh, of, for example, um, neurological conditions, depression, ALS, uh, and similar. Uh, and this is, Modality AI is a, like uh, a startup which has been founded uh, nearly three years ago and located in the US and San Francisco. And we are looking uh, at basically, so we have a multimodal conversational agent and patients have basically interactions and during the interactions, we are analyzing their facial movements, their respiratory, uh, so we have some respiratory exercises like coughing or breathing, as well as, of course, speech, which we analyze to then see how they uh, progress. For example, does the depression get worse or not? And uh, we, of course, provide this metrics also for like evaluation purpose directly to the clinicians so that it's not like get, giving, like saying, okay, this guy gets less depressed, but the The clinician can actually watch the video of the interaction, can look at the metrics we obtain to verify that everything is, uh, whether, whether actually this patient need more uh, help or things are getting better, for example. Um, this is basically to modality AI. And, but this talk is uh, purely focusing on grounding, basically, 
which is the work I'm focusing on during my uh, PhD. Um, so yeah, let, so let's get started. So uh, so this is basically about, so I was, when I started was grounding, working on grounding. So I started uh, originally looking more at knowledge representation and came to grounding uh, because uh, to really use knowledge representations for robotics, we basically need to somehow have this knowledge grounded. And, uh, and then uh, I started looking at unsupervised grounding approaches. And then about last year, at the beginning of last year, there, there were some limitations. Uh, there are some limitations of unsupervised approaches. And due to this, I started looking then of how to uh, combine this with supervised approaches. But I will explain this in more detail in the next slides. So let's maybe first start uh, by by, uh, by talking very briefly about, okay, what is language grounding and why should we care? Uh, so in brief, language grounding aims to provide meaning to language by linking it to perceptual information, which is basically direct grounding, or by linking uh, concepts, non-grounded concepts to already grounded concepts, which provides indirect grounding. Uh, and maybe let's give a quick illustration. Let's say we have the following scene. Uh, and we, so just a table with a chair behind the table and two fruits on the table. And if we now get this following instruction, then it's very easy for us to understand what the task is to basically, we don't even need to know that the apple is on the table. We don't need this additional information, just the red apple tells us which, what is the target object and please give the request of the, uh, the, the apple is also pretty easy to understand. But if we have an artificial system, then basically what we have is, uh, on the one hand side, we have a set of words and in this case, we just focus for simplicity on just uh, uh, the target object, uh, the words describing the target object. And on the other hand, we have a, a set of concrete representations. And with concrete representations, I mean that uh, we basically, so if we have a red object, let's say we have a red apple and we have another red apple or for example, a tomato, um, then they all slightly vary on, or even if we have the same object, if the light changes, the, the RGB values, for example, would change uh, if we take a picture of it. And in this case, the concrete representation can be, for example, obtained by uh, classification algorithms or uh, clustering algorithms. So that we basically, everything that is red from, uh, belongs to this, uh, to this concept of red, in a sense that this basically uh, then will be assigned to the same cluster or given the same uh, classification label. Um, and if we look at the at the right side at the bottom, there is a W, this stands for auxiliary word, because we also have to consider that some words don't have a corresponding concrete representation. For example, in this case, the article V uh, only is there for grammatical reasons. Um, but we also have our auxiliary words which might have semantic meaning. For example, if we have a sentence with neither nor and we change it to either or, or then this are still, they, they don't have a concrete representation in the world, but it completely changes, the reverses the meaning of the sentence. So they're still quite, can be quite important auxiliary words. Um, and then the, the grounding problem, of course, is that we have, for example, the uh, the article V, and we have, if we have no prior knowledge of language, we have no idea which concrete representation it actually refers to. And basically the same is for all the other words. Um, and even if we would know that red already refers to uh, a color, then still we have the problem that we have multiple colors, or if we know table refers to uh, a shape or an object, then we still have multiple shape percepts in this situation. And this is still a very simple situation. I mean, if we look in the real world, then on a table, on a dining table, we might have, I don't know, 20, 30 objects. So it's a lot more than just two fruits on a table. Um, and what we want are basically mappings uh, from, from the left side, from the words to the concrete representations. Um, what is interesting here, of course, is that um, we don't necessarily want to have, or we want in most studies, uh, what, is what are obtained are one-to-one -one mappings, but the world is actually not so simple. So we have synonyms. So if we, we could say instead of red, we could say reddish. Um, some people might argue they're not completely true synonyms, but they are basically just in some context because reddish might be less red than red, for example. Um, but in the end, they can be in some context be synonyms. And then we can 
And so if we say that words are equal to concepts, this doesn't work because we, we then we would have duplicate concepts. We could now argue that concrete representations are kind of similar to concepts. I mean, we could also say concept is maybe an ill-defined term anyway, uh, but so if we just stick to that term, then that might be maybe a good idea. But then also if we talk about concrete representations, then we might also have multiple concrete representations for the same percept. For example, um, we might, if we if we talk about the concept of red, we might represent this through color histograms or RGB mean values of all the pixels belonging to a specific object, if we take a picture of it. Um, so basically, what, what in the end we would like to have are M to N mappings. Basically, we have multiple words can refer to one concept and uh, multi, uh, and the concept can be grounded through multiple concrete representations. So it's not as it looks here as simple as one to one mappings. Um, so just one more example, why, why is this important? I mean, language is basically everywhere and it's the most important medium to transfer and preserve knowledge. And this transfer can be both directional or unidirectional. So it can be spoken or written conversations. And it's not just that we have statements there. Uh, but we also have, like in the example I gave before, we have imperative utterances like um, do this for me, which would be very common in, uh, in human-robot interactions. But we might also have interrogative, which is also if we uh, have a conversation with an artificial agent, we might also say, hey, what's the, what's the weather or what's the temperature outside currently? Um, but we also have information like a lot of like the Wikipedia, we have a lot of other information in books uh, or online, which is very useful, especially if we if we talk about autonomous learning. Uh, so if we want to have natural and efficient autonomous learning and also human agent interactions, then we would like maybe to say, okay, please uh, make a pancake. And then we want the agent, then the agent could look up itself uh, the recipe and then it, it basically knows, okay, for example, okay, I have to crack open an egg. And then maybe it has to use reinforcement learning to actually learn how to do it properly, because even if we as humans do it, sometimes we don't completely pay attention. We basically know it, but we can still optimize how we do the movement so that we don't spill anything of it. And uh, the last point is that it's also, if we have proper language understanding, then this also makes interactions and learning more safe. So we can, for example, if we tell the, uh, if we say, please give me the knife, then the most efficient way from a, like a, a timing point of view might be to throw the knife at the human, but we don't really want this from a safety perspective. So if the agent understands due to some abstract knowledge that we don't, uh, that, that it's, it's dangerous, that the knife is sharp and sharp objects will hurt human skin, for example, then it wouldn't do this. Or the same if we say, please wash the dog, I mean, it's not a good idea to put the dog into, into the washing machine. So, uh, and this is also then the connection where knowledge representation, which is, uh, which unfortunately I will not focus on uh, in this talk, but which is also then where the link is that then we would need proper representation, explicit representation of concepts so that we actually have relation between concept and can reason about them. Um, but the main focus is here about two different kind of grounding approaches in this talk. So one is cross situational learning, which is an unsupervised learning mechanism. And one is interactive learning, which is a supervised learning mechanism. And for cross situational learning, the idea is that we track co-occurrences of words and concrete representations across situations. And then the idea is that if, uh, if a concrete representation can ground a word, then it should reliably reoccur together with this word across situations. Um, while in interactive learning, the idea is that we have a tutor who supports the agent to limit the solution space, for example, um, by removing some objects or to pointing to an object in the scene to say, okay, I'm talking about this object, or I guess might be another example, um, and or to provide feedback, for example, if the agents then agent picks the wrong object, then we would actually provide feedback and say, oh, that's the wrong one, I didn't refer to I don't know, the, the orange, I meant the apple. Um, and cross situational learning is inspired by word learning in children if no prior knowledge is available. And there are some interesting studies which show that this is a, a mechanism used a lot by children. And there are even some studies saying that this is, the, this is how most words are learned. Um, I'm not really from linguis linguistics, so I'm not sure how, what the agreement there is in the, in the linguistics community, whether this is really the most common mechanism or not, but uh, at least there are some studies 
um, claiming this and also supporting this with experimental evidence. Um, and then on the other hand, we have interactive learning, which is also is inspired by language evolution. So it doesn't mean that we need to have an agent knowing the natural language. It might also be that we have two agents who have no language in common, but they can then basically um, create a language due to interaction be because one agent refers to one object with a name which has at that moment no meaning but it become, gets a meaning when the other agent then also adopts this name for that object um, but of course at the same time interactive learning is also can be used for grounding and it's it's also at the same time uh, it also can be in take inspiration from how children learn because we have the examples where parents say for example or do you see and then referring to some object or where they refer to an object and the 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 child grabs that one and and they give positive reward or the child picks another one and they so say no i meant the other one so both are have tra take some inspiration from word learning in children and the interesting thing is that cross edition learning requires a large number of samples to learn especially if we think about very complex situations with a lot of objects in, in the view at the same time, for example. Well, interactive learning can already learn from a small number of samples. Um, while at the same time, interactive learning requires external support to learn, another agent uh, supporting the learning, while cross edition learning does not require external support. So what we can see already here is that one advantage, the advantage of one of the, the, the approaches, the paradigms, is the disadvantage of the other and vice versa. So it seems to be quite intuitive that we could try to combine them. And so this was kind of a very abstract introduction to cross edition learning and interactive learning. So that let's, let me give a quick illustration. So if we have the, the scene we had before, and we just look at for the, for the concrete representations, now we just look at the, the concrete representations belonging to the words describing the manipulation objects, then we just have for the first situation four concrete representations. Then we can't really learn anything here because I mean it's cross edition learning, so we need at least two uh, situations. Uh, if we have now another situation, and what we see here is that the, the, we have three concrete representation and three words which appear in uh, in both situations, and I am now discarding on purpose the auxiliary word that. So I'm assuming we already know about this, or we used, for example, also cross edition learning to identify it. For example, by seeing in the first situation, if we just look at the, this situation, that uh, we only have one word which occurs twice and we have no concrete representation which occurs twice so that might be an indication that this is actually an auxiliary word um, but if we look at the non-auxiliary words then we have three can we have basically three words occurring in both situations and three concrete representations so again we can't really know which one refers to which one but if we have another situation so the yellow banana on the chair then this situation has nothing in common with the first situation and with the second situation it only has in common uh, one concrete representation and one word and this we can then use to basically uh, create a mapping from the word yellow to the corresponding concrete representation so if we now look at interactive learning then the idea is to that the tutor supports the learning so one way is to restrict the solution space so instead of saying uh, the whole sentence, the, the tutor would just say red apple or even just apple. So there are quite a lot of studies where just a single word is provided. And then the tutor will at the same time also point to the, to the target object. And this way, what we obtain are uh, two words and two um, concrete representations. And from this, we can't really learn much because we don't know which word refers to which concrete representation. However, if we now get the same second situation as before, so the yellow apple, then we can already see that only one concrete representation and word occurs in both, and we can create the corresponding mapping. And then if we have the third situation, again, only one concrete representation and one word occurs in both in the second situation, third situation, so we can create again the corresponding mapping. And what we see also here is that it's kind of similar to cross citation learning. It's just that it uh, it's a more uh, simplified form due to the information provided by the tutor. And so this would be, for example, restricting the solution space. But if we provide feedback, it would be, for example, getting this whole sentence. And then afterwards, the agent grabs the wrong object or points to the wrong object. And then we would say, no, uh, I meant the, uh, the, the apple, for example, and then pointing to that object and then basically we again have this kind of uh, simplified version 
afterwards. Um, let's go to and so this is basically as an introduction. And what I will now do is I will um, I will um, show two experiments uh, which I've done. Um, one is uh, it's an evaluation of an of a kind of novel cross edition learning based online grounding algorithm. Uh, I'm putting novel here in italics because it's already, I mean, uh, the first version of it I proposed already uh, more than two years ago, so it's not so novel anymore in that sense. Um, and I will compare it to an unsupervised Bayesian learning model um, because um, I use this as a baseline because this is what originally also when I started working on grounding, this was what I first used for uh, for, for language grounding. So it, it was, it's, it's not designed as a baseline, but it was originally in a sense the proposed model. And I will compare both the accuracy of the obtained groundings, the transparency of the grounding process, as well as the deployability for open-ended interactions. So let's talk about the scenario we have here. So it's a quite simple human-robot interaction scenario. So basically we have a robot and a tutor interacting in front of a tabletop environment. And then the idea is that during the first step, a tutor places an object on the table and the robot, robot obtains its shape and color. Then the tutor provides an instruction, for example, erase the brown coke. And then the robot executes the requested action and records the corresponding percept. Um, overall, 125 interactions were performed so that all combinations of the employed five actions, five colors, and five shapes uh, were used. And the sentence was quite simple. It's just, please, an action word, the, a color word, and a shape word. Um, but to make it more difficult, and since originally this uh, this interactions were performed to look at different word representations uh, and how they can, whether different word representations are better for synonyms, for example, if we have semantic information due to word vectors, um, that's why we have two synonyms for actions and colors and five synonyms for shapes. For example, if we refer to the bottle, we can refer to it uh, by saying Coca-Cola, Sodi, Pepsi, Coke, or Lemonade. So these are not true synonyms, but these are only synonyms in a specific context. Um, and then the proposed framework, basically what we have as input is the scene, uh, the sentence, and then uh, an action feature vector. So for example, the, the HSR robot is uh, lifting up the book. Um, and then what we do with the scene is, so we normally, so it's just for illustrative purposes that we have three objects. So in this experiment, there's only one object at a time. And then we have 3D segmentation uh, to obtain uh, a shape percept, which is a, view, a viewpoint feature histogram descriptor, and a color histogram describing the color of the object. Um, then auxiliary word detection is applied. I will explain the algorithm on a, uh, on a later slide, uh, which should then, if it works well, remove the auxiliary word that we just have the non-auxiliary words. And then for the action learning, we uh, obtain an action feature vector, which is a 30-dimensional vector. Uh, because all the uh, the maximum number of sub uh, actions to perform an action uh, was was uh, five, and then we had six different joints which were observed. Uh, that basically, so in, in the definition was basically uh, how what what is the difference between the beginning of the joint position, for example, at the beginning and the end of the of the of the sub action. And then to uh, obtain, because these are our percepts, so this is, we might have uh, twice the color red, but uh, we have different color histograms. There are slight, slight variants in it. So then uh, clustering is used to obtain concrete representations for all modalities. Uh, and for clustering, DB scan was used because DB scan doesn't require uh, to specify the number of clusters in advance. Um, and then this is given to the cross situation learning grounding algorithm. A constitution learning based grounding algorithm. Um, so let's explain how this works. Um, so I apologize for the for the acronyms, but this is to fit this all on the slide. Uh, so I will explain them. So so the input for the grounding algorithm is uh, W, which is the uh, the set of the current words. CR stands for concrete representations. So this is our set of concrete representations of the current situation. WCR uh, PS is basically uh, a set of word concrete representation pairs. So that means for every word which the uh, the agent encountered in the current way uh, in the previous situations at the, at that point when we start the grounding process, um, we have a set of the cores the the uh, 
the concrete representation it was encountered with, with a corresponding count, how often it was encountered in how many situations. Um, and then we have the, the, the reverse. So we have concrete representation, uh, uh, word pairs. Again, we have all concrete representations which we encountered in previous situations, uh, plus the uh, together with the words they have been encountered with and the count. And we need both of this. It seem, might seem like quite redundant information because we want to uh, we want to ensure that we can treat synonyms and homonyms. So in this scenario, we only have synonyms, but in the second experiment, we will also have homonyms. Um, and then for then we have AW, which is a set of auxiliary words, which we have previously uh, detected, and PP, which means permanent phrases. And in this case, uh, they have been basically predefined. So uh, we just have a dictionary basically where we say, okay, lift up needs to be treated as one word. Um, I there was I have a cross edition learning based phrase detection algorithm, but it doesn't work on this simple sentences. So it only worked uh, on more complex sentences. So that's why in this case we just uh, basically assume we already have prior knowledge that we know the uh, the, the the phrases. And then the first thing is that we substitute words with phrases from the uh, phrase set. And then we update the auxiliary words, a set of auxiliary words. And for this, we look at the, uh, we have basically a set of words and how often they occurred. This is WO, CRO means a set of computer representations and how often they occurred. And then we have a set of auxiliary words. And then we basically just look for each word that whether it occurred more than twice as many times as the most occurring concrete representation. If, and if that's the case, then the assumption is that this must be an auxiliary word. Uh, and then we basically add that word to the set of auxiliary words. And this seems to be very, very simple as a, as a mechanism, but so far uh, all the scenarios I applied this to, it worked. So either it didn't get the auxiliary words which in most cases it did, but it might be possible in some cases, or it would basically uh, not detect it. And so it doesn't get the auxiliary word or it gets it right. So it didn't produce any false positives, which would otherwise be not good because we assume this is permanently treated as an auxiliary word. So this is no longer updated. Once an auxiliary word, always an auxiliary word in this case. Um, and then afterwards, we remove the auxiliary words. So all the auxiliary words we have in AW from the words in, of the current instruction from the current situation. Um, then we update uh, WCRPS and CRWPS using the current words and concrete, non, the current non-auxiliary words and concrete representations. So we just basically update the counts or add, for example, a new pair if this hasn't been discovered before. And then we just look for each word. Uh, for the highest word concrete representation pair and add this to the set of grounded words. Uh, and then we do the same for concrete uh, representations. So we look for each uh, concrete representation, which is the, the mapping which had the highest occurrence. So which word did it occur the most with? And this, this is again, this is for synonyms and we need both for synonyms and homonyms. And then afterwards, we also match uh, that we merge these two sets so that we basically uh, have them combined in one, uh, the mappings combined. And, um, and uh, the important thing is that this is done. Uh, so GCR uh, and GW are kind of recreated every situation based on how the, uh, the, the pairs basically changed, how our, based on the co new, new co occurrence information. Um, and so this was for the proposed framework. Uh, let's now go to the baseline framework. So again, we have the same uh, percepts, but we directly give them to a probabilistic model because basically internally, this model, uh, which I use for this experiment, is using k-means. So it's basically using internally uh, clustering to know where in the space uh, the, uh, the percepts are located. Um, and then, so in, in this, we have four observed uh, states. We have basically uh, the shape, color, and action percept. And we have also uh, WI, which represents a word index for each word. And word index means that every word has a different number. 
if, if we want an index, uh, meaning that if we have, for example, lemonade and Coke, which in our scenario are synonyms, they still are represented by different numbers. Only if we have Coke and Coke, this are really equal. Uh, and then Gibbs sampling is used to infer the latent variables uh, and Gibbs sampling was done for 100 iterations. Um, and then overall, so we recorded all this data. So we basically then also because the probabilistic model needs offline uh, training uh, in comparison to the online grounding model. Uh, that's why 10 different interaction sequences are created to ensure that the order of the situations has no influence or to, to minimize the influence on the uh, performance we obtain on, on the evaluation results. And then two different train test splits were analyzed. Um, the reason is because the probabilistic model is work need an, needs an offline training phase while the online grounding model does not require this. It basically updates the mapping with every situation, every new situation it encounters. So that's why in the first case we look at, we use all situations for training and testing because this is basically the natural case for the proposed model because we don't have any explicit uh, explicit training. While this is kind of a too good to be true scenario for the probabilistic model, because that uh, normally we can't assume that we have a training set which uh, kind of represents all possible situations we could ever encounter. This is why we have the second case where we only use 60% for training and 40% for testing, uh, which basically is more natural for the probabilistic model that we assume uh, we didn't encounter any of uh, we we have mostly situations we didn't encounter during training during, uh, after deployment while for the uh, for the uh, for the proposed model this is basically an artificial limitation that we say after 60 percent encounter after seeing 60 percent of the situations now we uh, basically switch off the learning and it's no longer allowed it's just allowed to uh, use its mapping but no longer to update its mapping and so this is basically uh, what um, Okay, uh, th normally there should be a reference, but somehow I, it's not in here. I don't know why. Uh, so this is uh, this is showing two lines. So this shows the number of correct mappings in just the proposed model uh, because for the uh, for because of the fact that the uh, baseline model uh, doesn't learn continuously but needs a uh, needs um, needs a training phase as separate. And so UOG is basically an earlier version of this. So this is the latest version, which actually is uh, published uh, at, at an ACL workshop last year. Um, and so this is a slightly improved version uh, of the algorithm. Uh, mostly the auxiliary word detection algorithm has been changed as well as uh, there was a restriction which limited that it first had to make, create a mapping for every word before it was allowed to make a, weapon, a, a, a mapping for um, and an additional mapping for uh, any other word. Uh, so it had to basically first ground use, no, wait, it had to use all concrete representations first once for grounding before it was allowed to ground, uh, use one concrete representation to ground a second word. Uh, and I know this was introduced at the beginning a uh, long time ago. Uh, I don't know exactly what the reason was, but it was at that time, I think, required. Uh, but after making some other changes to the algorithm, this is no longer required. And by removing these limitations, which now basically is no longer required, uh, the performance actually improves. And what we can see here is that um, basically the model requires, so at the beginning we have more false mappings and correct mappings represented by the red lines. Um, but after about 10 situations, it's basically equal. So we have already about 12 correct mappings. And then the more situations we encounter, the more uh, the number of correct mappings increases and the number of incorrect mappings decreases. And uh, the dotted line at the end represents the 40%, which we only encountered in one of the two scenarios we looked into. Uh, so if we only use 60% for training, then basically, it doesn't learn all the correct mappings. So only if we use really, so it basically the last correct mapping it learned after like 124 situations. So just on time in a sense. Um, so this shows that it's quite transparent what the current mappings are. So this regarding the transparency and it's also, uh, it shows it's like 
learning mechanism that it really learns online that we can really see how slowly the number of correct mappings increases. Um, then if we look at the accuracies we see for if we provide all situations you, uh, for training and testing, then the proposed model gets all of them basically right if we look at accuracies. Well, the probabilistic uh, graphical model uh, makes it gets a pretty good uh, performance for shapes. And this is mostly because the, the clustering was the best for this. Um, while um, at the same time, it's interesting because there are, it has for shape uh, concrete representations, we actually have five words for each concrete representation. So we have like 25 shape words. So we have a lot more. Um, while if we only use 60% of the situations for training and 40% for testing, then we see that here the uh, the proposed model doesn't achieve. Uh, so it, it also, uh, it basically doesn't learn all the shape mappings anymore because it doesn't get enough information. Um, and there we see also the difference between the, like the small improvement in auxiliary word detection and also the small improvement by removing the restriction that uh, if we had the previous model from the ACL workshop, uh, it didn't learn all the column mappings while well, it does for the uh, for the current proposed model uh, and for the graphical model we see that the performance decreases and it's very interesting that it very drastically decreases for the shapes and this seems to be that due to the fact that we really have so many shape words and this is suddenly no longer sufficient to uh, by redu re reducing it to like only seeing 60 percent it suddenly can't really learn the correct mappings there anymore. Because this is not just one run which went bad. We, I mean, we still have 10 different uh, sequences we are analyzing here. Um, if we look at the confusion matrix, this is also quite interesting because uh, we see here, for example, I mean, here you can see the words which I actually used. Um, so if for, for the word Narnia, which, which will refer to a book, in this case, um, we see that it was also uh, it was also sometimes uh, seen as a color, um, and this is uh, so the words are mostly chosen because it, it was initially used also this experiment to analyze different word representations, including vectors. So these were uh, words which were in the vector in the data set to train word to vec, uh, and then for the baseline model we see that we have the, the colors are pretty good. Um, so this is the case, 60% training, 40% testing. While we see that for shapes, and most of the shapes are basically seen as actions, uh, while the actions are also pretty good. So we, we see that the biggest problem here really was with, with the shapes, that they were more seen as actions. Well, we, it's not that the model says everything is a shape because we see still for colors, I mean, especially for pink and pinkish, it's, it's pretty good. Um, so, to conclude, so this was just to, to kind of present the, the unsupervised grounding model, which now in the second study we will extend to use also interactive learning. Uh, what we see is that the proposed unsupervised grounding framework is able to detect auxiliary words and ground synonyms through corresponding concrete representations, and it is able to do this in an online manner. And we can also see that the accuracy is higher than the baseline uh, framework. It's more transparent because we can actually see how over time the um, the, the mappings change. And also this, this online learning uh, capability makes it more, uh, it makes it more likely that we can actually deploy it for, for open-ended human agent interactions. Uh, of course, there are a lot of other limitations, uh, like for example, uh, scalability, that if we have a lot more complex situations, it might take just far too long until it learns something. Um, so let's go to the second experiment. And the idea is here to propose a framework that combines cross edition learning and interactive learning by extending the previously presented cross edition learning framework with mechanisms to also uh, utilize feedback from a tutor. If it is available, but if not, it can still just use cross edition learning. And the main research questions are, does feedback improve the sample efficiency of the framework? Does it improve the accuracy of the obtained groundings? And then two different kinds of feedback uh, we will investigate. One is ver verbal, uh, just pointing feedback. So where we basically, we just, the, the robot is, uh, the agent is pointing to the object, a thing which was uh, described. And then afterwards, we just point to the correct one. Uh, and then it utilizes this feedback whether uh, to update its mappings. 
or whether we say we actually point, for example, if it was the correct one, we point to the correct, uh, it points to the, the tutor point to the correct object. And in that case then says, for example, um, uh, yes, the green cube, or for example, points to, uh, points, if it was the wrong object, the agent pointed to then points to another, to the correct object, and then says, no, the, like the, the blue cube, for example. Um, so we want to see, is there an advantage of having verbal and pointing feedback both combined or in comparison to just pointing only feedback? Um, so the environment is used is based on the Clever data set. Um, and it's not the Clever data set, but in this case, I uh, used the scripts provided uh, um, in the GitHub repository to um, create new uh, scenes, which contain three or four objects with random shapes, colors, materials, sizes, and positions. Uh, and then three modalities were extracted for each scene. So I didn't use the, the pictures, but I actually directly from Blender extracted viewpoint feature histogram descriptors and the the object pixels to then create uh, use uh, uh, to create a concrete representation uh, to to use as perceptual feature vectors. Sorry, the the mean RGB values. And then for propositions, uh, 3D spatial vectors were used, and they describe the spatial relation between the centroids of two objects. So the target, uh, in this case, only one proposition vector was created for, be for between the target and the reference object. Um, while theoretically, uh, we the, the agent would observe basically for four objects, 12 different 3D spatial vectors, or for three objects, already six. Um, but this is a simplification because Otherwise, it would most likely not be able to learn. And this is a simplification which also uh, is used in most studies. So whenever prepositions are grounded, they normally don't, they provide just the preposition of, uh, they, they refer to actually in, this, in, this, in the utterance and not all possible preposition between all, pos all objects which are currently visible to the, object, uh, to the, to the agent. Um, overall, 1,000 inter interactions were simulated. And all sentences had the following structure. So the color shape, so the color and shape referring to the target object, preposition, and then the article D again, and then the color and shape of the reference object. Uh, and 12 shapes, 16 colors, six preposition, uh, and one auxiliary word were used. And overall, there are three shapes, uh, so cylinder, ball, and, uh, and cube and eight colors and four prepositions. Um, what, is Im what is interesting or important to mention here for the prepositions that we actually have homonyms um, because for prepositions um, we have as words, we have, for example, to the left or to the right. So let's maybe go back one slide. So if we have the example on the right and we look at, we say, uh, we, we say the, the target object is for example, the, the red cylinder and we say the red cylinder to the, lev uh, to the left of the green cylinder, um, then we have to the left. But if we actually look at this, we see that the red cylinder is actually both to the left and in front. So it's basically, it is theoretically possible in very rare cases that they are directly to the left or directly behind to the right or in front. But in most cases, an object is normally in basically an area which is both to the left on and in front or for example in front and to the right and this means that we basically if we say to the left we have two different concrete representations that are correct one is to the left and in front and to the left and behind and so the interesting thing is also to see whether the model can actually cope with this and actually ground the words through both of these concrete representations Okay, let's go back here. So, so what is the interaction procedure? So it's quite similar to the previous one we used, at least at the beginning. So we have a tutor placing three or four objects in the environment. So basically we generate a scene and the agent obtains a shape, color and preposition percepts. Then the tutor provides a natural language description of the target object, for example, the red cylinder in front of the yellowish cylinder. And then the agent updates its word concrete representation mappings using the cross-situational learning algorithm, which I described for the uh, previous experiment. Um, but then we have some additional steps. So the agent determines the target and points to it based on the current mappings it has. Uh, and for example, if it's not true, then it basically randomly points to something uh, at the beginning. And then the tutor sig signals success or failure. And this can be either through just pointing, 
but if it points basically at the same object as uh, the agent pointed to, then basically it's a success. If it points to a different one, then it's failure. Uh, if or otherwise through basically uh, also available description saying yes, the color and shape. So for example, the red cube or no, uh, the blue cylinder. And then the agent updates at word concrete representation mappings based on the received feedback. Um, so the framework overview is quite similar as before. So we have our auxiliary word detection algorithm, which is exactly as before. And we have uh, for percepts extraction, we just have viewpoint features, two gram descriptors, RGP mean values, and 3D spatial vectors. And again, we use clustering to obtain concrete representations. And again, we use DB scan for clustering. And then this is given again to the cross citation learning algorithm. Um, so this is basically just as recap. So this is what we had before that we, uh, the steps. Uh, and now we have a new mechanism. And so in this case, we have as input, uh, the words WI, which are the words of the current in, uh, instruction. Then we have WF, which is optional. So the, the feedback words, for example, yes, the red cube or something like this. Then we have AOCR, which is basically the concrete, the set of all containing all the concrete representations of all objects in the scene. Then we have TOCR, which is basically just the concrete representations of the target object, and this is obtained based on based by uh, uh, the pointing of the tutor by the feedback. Then we have uh, AW, which are just the uh, set of auxiliary words. Then we and then we have WCRPSF and CRWPSF, which are basically the same as before. So we have all the set of all uh, words we encountered so far uh, and all the uh, all the concrete representations. But in this case, this is just for the things we encountered during this feedback phase. So this is basically we we keep them separate from the other mappings um, to ensure that uh, to basically ensure that uh, we still learn without feedback and we we also ensure that still it is possible that uh, uh, for example if a wrong uh, wrong pointing the, the, the tutor points to the wrong object that we are still uh, able to use the cross citation unsupervised learned information to maybe say okay actually that tells us that uh, this is not the best mapping um, so we don't override what we have learned through cross citation learning, but we keep them uh, in parallel, basically. Um, although uh, how much this really helps with wrong feedback, I don't know because I uh, didn't yet investigate this part, how, uh, providing wrong feedback, how much, uh, how much does it uh, decrease the performance, basically? And does it even make it worse than just having cross citation learning, for example? Or is it still there is some improvement or it's equal to having no feedback? I don't, this will, this is still future work. Um, then we have FRC, which is just a constant, which says how important, how much more valuable the feedback is compared to the uh, the mappings obtained in, in an unsupervised manner. And so this was just uh, uh, due to different experiments. I just uh, tried out different factors here and the best was basically to say it's twice as important. So it's not more important, uh, but it's twice as important. Um, and then what we first obtain is we look, we, we take the set of all the objects, the concrete representation of all the objects, and basically remove the ones of the, of the, uh, of the target object so that we just have NOCR, the, the set of all the concrete, of the concrete representation of the non-target uh, objects. And then if we have a feedback sentence, so we have verbal feedback, this is not an empty set, but we have, there are some words, uh, no, sorry, the other way around. If we don't have a feedback sentence, uh, then for all the words uh, and concrete representations, which we, uh, so all the words um, in the whole in sentence and the whole uh, utterance, which don't are not only the words referring to the target object, but also the other words, uh, we basically have also then uh, we, we basically create a mapping with the concrete representations of the target object. And basically, this if we have already mapping, then we basically add a count of two. So this is how we ensure that this is more important than the mappings we learn from unsupervised, because they are, whenever we encounter them, we just increase the count by one, basically. And in the other case, if we have 
verbal feedback, then first we do kind of the same here. So that's the same that for uh, for basically um, on nearly the same because here we only in, uh, increase it for the words in the feedback sentence. We increase uh, the count, not for all the other words which refer to something else. We don't know which objects, but to, to the reference object, for example, the preposition. Um, and at the same time, we also look at at all the other um, words uh, at, at all. So all the other um, for all the other. So, so sorry, not the words. The concrete representations of the which refer to the other objects. That for them we actually decrease the count of the mapping to ensure because we are kind of certain that um, this uh, this is not the correct mapping, even though there might be uh, here an issue if we have, for example, uh, we, we, we several times we say, oh, the, the red cube to the left of the red something, then this might actually interfere there a little bit. Um, but this is basically to, to, to decrease the likelihood of, uh, of, uh, of wrong mappings based on the feedback. Um, and then we return these two sets uh, with the feedback, ma feedback mappings. And then basically what we do, so this is the, the main difference of to the main uh, cross section learning algorithm that we basically merge, uh, every situation we merge these two mappings to then look based on the combined. So for example, if we have for one mapping, we have a count based on unsupervised of two. And for the feedback we have of let's say four, then the overall count is six. And this might make it suddenly because of the feedback, the highest word concrete representation pair uh, well, without the feedback, it would be some other word. Uh, and the same we, of course, do for con concrete representation word pairs. Uh, and otherwise, everything stays the same. So this feedback mechanism, the idea was that we don't want to really, uh, we don't want to uh, influence the cross section learning mechanism a lot. We just want to, uh, we want to ensure that the, the, the agent still learns without feedback and that if there is wrong feedback that the influence is hopefully minimized. But again, this I can't really tell much right now because I, in this situation, we in this scenario, we only had correct feedback. And if we look now at the results, at the mappings, what we see is for pointing only feedback that uh, there is not so much difference. Actually, there is some difference. So they're actually very close to each other. Sorry for that. So it's maybe not so easy to see. So the, I mean, the the one line is uh, the um, no feedback is basically the continuous line, which is mostly in the middle, both for the correct and the, so it's a, the lowest uh, blue line representing the lowest performance for uh, correct mappings and the highest red line representing the number of false mappings. Uh, and then in the, in the middle, uh, we have the uh, a, a line, a dashed line, which represents if we have in 50%, so on average, every second situation, we provide feedback, um, where we see that this improves the performance already. Uh, also, at the end, the number of mappings we obtain, so we obtain about four mappings more, correct, and also the number of false mappings decreases by four. Uh, and then we have, um, if we have the 100%, uh, so every situation we provide feedback, we see that this in finally doesn't make much of a difference, but it, at least it speeds a little bit up the process. Um, but we see overall that pointing only feedback um, provides some benefit, but it's not that it's really a lot of benefit in a sense. Um, while if we look at pointing and verbal feedback, what we see is that um, here there is a lot more increase and decrease uh, of the performance. And we also see that there is a difference between providing this feedback every time, every situation, or only on average every second. Um, and so here we really see that uh, instead of obtaining about 26 mappings, we obtain more than 32 mappings correctly, and also the number of false mapping, mappings is lower. And um, the reason why we still, so uh, the reason why, even if we would obtain perfect, all correct mappings, why we would still have um, some false mappings is because we allow homonyms and synonyms. So it might be that we have some additional mappings which are uh, actually not, um, which are not even required in the sense to, to, to have all the correct mappings correctly obtained. Um, but here we see clearly that pointing and verbal feedback is better than just pointing only feedback. And we see that it both increases the, 
the, the accuracy, so the number of correct mappings we obtain, but it also in, in the sample efficiency, so, so more quickly we reach a higher number of mappings. So if we look at the accuracies, uh, then we see uh, for pointing only feedback that the most increase is for shapes uh, and a little bit increase for colors, but there is actually a decrease for propositions, which is quite interesting. And we see a little bit more about that later. Um, while there is not much difference if we go from 50% feedback rate to 100% uh, feedback, while for pointing only uh, uh, and verbal feed, uh, sorry, for pointing and verbal feedback combined, then we see that it basically continuously increases and it really makes a big difference, for example, for prepositions. Um, if Oliver, we look at the. Hmm? Oliver, Oliver yeah. just to let you know that. Um, it's been almost an hour, so you, you're running to the end of your time. So please. Yep. Okay. Yeah, I'm nearly. I'm nearly done. So this is all kind of the last slides. Um, so, this is basically if we look at the. Um, so this this is basically here we see more details about the mapping the, com the confusion matrices for the modalities, and we see for ex for example that uh, some of the propositions the most confusion is actually with shapes. Uh, and but there is a lot less confusion especially for shapes there is a lot less confusion with colors when we have uh, when we have pointing only feedback well if we have pointing and verbal feedback then this really helps a lot with the propositions because we suddenly uh, we only look at the uh, at the feedback sentence the verbal uh, to we only consider them for the feedback mappings and not the whole, so all the sentences, uh, all, all the words in the, in the instruction. Um, and if we look at the, the mapping from, from words to concrete representations, uh, then one very interesting thing uh, is that we see for the prepositions that they are basically, uh, that they have mostly two, uh, so I mean, for, for no feedback, we see there's confusion with shapes, but if we look at pointing only feedback or more importantly, pointing and verbal feedback, then we see that the, they have some confusion between two concrete representations. And this is actually important because this shows that the model can correctly ground homonyms because what we see here is that, so 14 and 15 uh, is basically referring to uh, left behind and left front. And so this is correctly grounding on the left of, on, on the left side of, or for example, if we have behind, which is, has the, is basically 12 and 14 here. Uh, we can see, uh, so 12 and 14 is basically right behind and left behind. So we see that it properly grounded also homonyms. And with this basically, uh, I, I will conclude. So the, uh, the feedback, what we can see, the feedback improves the sample efficiency and accuracy. And we saw also that combined verbal and pointing is better than pointing only feedback. Um, however, we we didn't evaluate yet how robust the model is, uh, is how robust it is to incorrect feedback and how also does feedback compare to explicit teaching. Uh, but so this are kind of follow up things to investigate, follow up questions. Uh, but of course, there are a lot more like if we really want to scale this, then there are a lot more broader questions which need investigation. But uh, this is kind of our interesting questions to look into when looking at combining uh, supervised and unsupervised grounding approaches. And with this, I would like to thank you for your attention. And then if there are any questions, just uh, let me know. Okay, let me thank you very much, first of all, for a very interesting and informative talk.